So we return to our longish, longish series on um, uh, Judge Sabo's discussion about Ingles's on authority. And today we're going to look at uh, the section called Ingles' Idea of Authority. We'll probably get through part one and maybe part two. Um, we'll see how far we get. I have I suspect I'm going to have a lot to say. And we'll we'll see about that as we come to it. Um, and so with much ado, let's get back to the text about a text. English's idea of authority, part one. A number of socialists lately have launched, have launched a regular crusade against what they call the principle of authority. It suffices to tell them that this or that act is authoritarian for it to be condemned. This summary mode of procedure is being abused to such an extent that it has become necessary to look into the matter somewhat more closely. Ingalls begins by establishing why the essay is necessary to combat the rise of anti-authoritarian socialism. I'm not sure that that's exactly what he's saying there. Let's go back to this thing. A number of socialists have latterly launched a regular crusade against what they call the principle of authority. It suffices to tell them that this or that act is authoritarian for it to be condemned. This summary mode of procedure is being abused to such an extent that it has become necessary to look into the matter somewhat closely. Now, if I'm reading Ingalls is literally there, I have to say he's more concerned about the abuse of this accusation of authority. Now, that still might so end up being exactly what Judge Sabo says here, but I'm just, I'm reading what the words say verbatim. Because the word anarchist is not used anywhere in on authority, the occasional reader tends to ask whether or not this essay is really meant to be about anarchism at all. Ingalls only refers to uh, anti-authoritarians are autonomist. Having seen the broader context of when it was written, it is clear Ingalls really did have anarchists in mind. Ingalls had simply written this essay so early in anarchism's development that even the name anarchism was not yet standardized. Members of this movement would be sometimes call themselves anarchists, but they could also refer to themselves as collectivists, federalists, revolutionary socialists, libertarians, and any number of other terms. Absolutely, that's just true. The name anarchism stuck in part, ironically enough, because it marks an Ingalls' frequent habit of labeling them this way, despite not doing so in on authority. Given all this, I would treat the word anarchist as interchangeable anytime Ingalls discusses the people he is critiquing. I agree with that too, but I, I, I do think we have to look here. He's saying that this, a number of socialists have regularly lost to a crusade. Those socialists would be a subset of socialists that we're going to see call anarchists. We're going to be careful on that because there are certain kinds of individual anarchists which just weren't, just didn't apply to. Um, Anyway, while Marx and Engels disagreed with anarchists on a number of different issues, Engels believes he is striking at the heart of anarchism itself by challenging their notion of authority. He believes that if anarchism is correct, then socialists must reject all authority. Asterisk. Many anarchists I know uh, in, high, in high school and college actually did reject all authority, but I, I remember in the classical anarchists and what I would call the post-classical liberal tradition, I call it that advisedly. Because I've always said giving classical liberalism purely over to the libertarians is to actually misread his history. Nonetheless, they're not really classical liberals either. Um, against this, he wants to defend some forms of authority as necessary, showing the sense of principle of anarchism is mistaken. I mean, yeah. I think this may be true, but that's not actually a literal reading of this section. All right, a literal reading of this section is that the accusation of authoritarianism is being overly leveraged, and that socialists are doing this to win debates without actually making that argument. 
which makes Ingles's later, de- you know, defensive authority even more problematic. But nonetheless, that does seem to be what's going on here. Part two. Authority in the sense in which the word is used here means the imposition of the will of another upon ours. And on the other hand, authority presupposes subordination. Now, that's a double word there. And we'll get back to that. And I think this is where another part of the problem. Ingalls defines authority as the imposition of the will of another upon ours. On its own, this is clearly inadequate as a scientific definition. Who is ours referring to? Absolutely. Ingalls and the reader, the working classes. I assume Ingalls intended this to be a more as a more universal form. So restating it, his intended definition is somewhat like the imposition of the will of one party upon another. This is more consistent with how authority is used elsewhere in the essay, since he discusses authority as being imposed not only on us, but also by enemies of the proletariat. Even this improved form is still imprecise, though, since we have no clear meaning for what for imposing something. It seems like it could be interpreted in at least three ways. Firstly, at the broadest, something might be imposed simply by being the case independently of our will and therefore requiring us to adapt it. This could include personal forms of authority, like someone ordering you around at gunpoint, but also impersonal ones. Rain may impose the need to find shelter, hunger, danger to flee, sickness to rest, and in this sense, it is not only the laws of the state, which are imposed upon us, but the laws of physics. Asterisk. This is the equivocation I noticed that Ingalls goes, uh, that actually uses this, like uses laws of the state and laws of willful imposition, and then like limitations of things happening to you as impositions. And he talks about them as both authority and in the same way. That is an equivocation and it's flawed, but that's an equivocation and an imprecise definition being used in the essay. And Judge Sabo is right to point it out. This idea of authority is inseparable from existence itself. Reality defines defines the limits of possibility. Human ingenuity may surprise us, turning what was thought impossible into the possible, but this is a change in human scientific knowledge or our material circumstances. Any freedom we enjoy is built upon these laws of nature, not their violation. Omnipotence is forever beyond us. With any innovation, new limits are always discovered. Abolishing authority of this kind would be as ridiculous as calling as a call to abolish the universe. Absolutely. Um, It seems like Engel's definition of authority prevents us from being able to interpret things quite this broadly. He has not defined authority as imposing, but as imposing a will. Bing! Although he does violate that later on in his argument. Uh, But nonetheless, that is what Engel's is doing. Who imposes the laws of nature? Unless the atheist Engel's believe that that they were established by God, or perhaps had converted at some, some form of animism, it seems like this sort of meaning is ruled out or at least limited. It does, but it's implied by the things that Eagles later says, which makes his focus on will here a little bit suspect. This brings us to the second option, which seems closely related to the first. Could someone be seen as imposing their will at any time they act to achieve an end that conflicts with the will of another? For example, suppose there are two roommates, one of which wants to listen to music while the other wants things to be quiet. If the latter decides to play music, there can be said to be imposing this on the former. Likewise, as the former turns off the music, they would then be imposing their rule on the latter, since of imposition is especially seen in matters of etiquette. Like when someone is knocking at your door uninvited, they might say sorry to impose. This meaning of impose is still incredibly broad, but seems consistent with Engel's definition. Uh, yeah. Abolishing authority in this sense seems similarly absurd. While it would not require ending existence itself, it would require the end of the human race or its conversion to some kind of unrecognizable hive mind. It would require no two people having conflicting goals, no matter how small, and that the person achieving their end would be imposing the state of affairs on the other. Importantly, this interpretation is neutral on the way something is imposed or the kind of social relation it implies. All that matters here is that the will of one party is implemented, which conflicts with another. If you ask someone out and they decline, then this is an act of authority being imposed upon you. If person A physically assaults person B, then this is an act of authority. So would person B defending themselves from person A. Even running from the fight would be an act of authority. Any act of will would be an act of authority by this definition. The imposition of authority is unable to distinguish between something being imposed and resistance to that opposition. All is seen are two conflicting wills.
This brings us to a third option where we do make this kind of distinction, considering not only the conflict and wills, but the method used and their function. There are several different ways this distinction could be made, such as by appealing to some moral standard or a sense of legitimacy. In this context, though, the most obvious way to distinguish an imposition to be with the establishment and exercise of relations of domination and servitude of exploiter and exploited, considering in contrast a free association or resistance. This is especially relevant when we consider materials class analysis as endorsed by Marxism, distinguished between the classes of oppressor and the oppressed. Uh, are the exploiter and the exploited the oppressor and the oppressed is too broad. Slavery, for example, is recognizable as a domination and exploitation of slaves by their masters. The privileged position is backed by a coercive force and may even be reaffirmed by law as an explicit right. Yeah. So in the Eric and Wright kind of distinctions, for example, slavery is a has both oppression and exploitation, whereas labor relations might have less oppression, although some, and lots of exploitation. Um so slavery is considered, you know, would be worse, um, et cetera. Now, Olin Wright also adds dominion to that, which is like people managing you. Um, but that's beyond here. For an essay called On Authority, there is surprisingly little telling us on what authority actually is. And I think that's on purpose. Ingalls does not clarify between any of these meanings. He does not compare and contrast the different definitions or explore any of these nuances. He presents this definition as if its meaning is self-evident and uncontroversial. Although, as I pointed out, he equivocates between these and his examples. That's Varn talking. Without any clear definition or explanation of Ingalls's intended meaning, we need to infer this from his examples. When multiple interpretations are possible, even there, confusion is spread, even amongst good faith readers. The one thing that Ingalls does clarify here is he is defining authority, quote, in the sense in which the word is used here. In other words, he is defining authority in the same way he understood the anarchists are using it in their, quote, regular crusade against what they call the principle of authority. Ingalls is not challenging an inferior anarchist definition of authority so that he could be replaced by a superior Marxist one. Whether he appears to believe that there is no inconsistency in how it uses the term and how anarchists use it. If our analysis show that Ingalls really is using a different definition of authority than anarchist, or even than himself, thus for Varn, this would be a major indicator that Ingalls is misrepresenting his opponents, or doesn't understand them. Uh, that's Varn adding that too. If he's trying to challenge the anarchists because they denounce all authority, then it is important that we understand properly what they meant by the term. Finally, Ingalls also states that the word authority here is inherently connected with the word subordination. Aha, I was waiting for that to come up. While one presupposes the other, Ingalls' definition of authority implies the existence of at least two parties, one imposing their will and the other being imposed upon. The former is the authority while the latter is being subordinated. We can see that Ingalls connects these ideas with authority throughout his essay as well. For example, autonomy is treated as the opposite of, of authority, marking the absence of any kind of imposition. Likewise, uh, authority is defined as despotic relationship are being dominant and subordination is identified with subjective are being made obedient. Part three. Now, since the two words sound bad and their relationship with a represent is disagreeable to the subordinated party, the question is to ascertain whether there's any way dispensing with it, rather given the conditions of present day society, we could not create another social system in which the authority would be given no scope any longer and which consequently would have to disappear. According to Engels, the main objection anarchists have to authority and subordination is both ways the words sound bad and that this authority is unpleasant for the subordinated party. The objection is clearly simplistic and shallow. Absolutely. <laughs> According to the word, sound bad can certainly be rhetorically useful, and something being unpleasant is a good reason to avoid it if possible, but appearances can be deceiving, and dealing with some of the unpleasantness is simply part of life if it can be shown to be necessary. Ingalls clearly wants to present the anarchist critique of authority as fundamentally naive, since it is sufficient to tell anarchists that, quote, this or that authoritarian for it to be condemned, the anarchist aims by creating a new social system which gets rid of authority entirely. Not only that, although it is unstated here, the anarchist also intended on achieving this authority free a society without the use of authority. The anarchist does not want to achieve a non authoritarian not only want to achieve a non-authoritarian society, he wants to use non-authoritarian methods to get there. 
on authority as a primary critique of these two positions, which he argues against with two main arguments. Firstly, he attempts to show authority cannot be abolished even in a socialist future, or at least cannot be abolished without consequences even more disagreeable than authority itself. He does not he does this by examining a type of society the anarchists advocate for and then demonstrating ways in which it does actually imply authoritarian relations, even if the anarchists themselves do not admit it. This is especially found in the need for administrative tasks to allow for groups to coordinate their actions with one another. Asterisk. This is also part of the the critique of Baku, uh, Bakunin as anti-democratic. Anyway, on asterisk. Second, he argues that achieving a socialist society will require utilizing authoritarian methods in our capitalist present. In particular, that workers will need, at least in some cases, to violently revolt against capitalism. This need for violence, therefore, is a need for authority, as is the consequence of state power in utilizing it to bring the means of production under control of the proletariat. The first argument here is clearly Engels' main one and takes up the vast majority of the essay. The second argument takes up a single paragraph near the end. Engels seems to view the first argument as more important, one since it implies a more fundamental error on the part of the anarchists striving for an impossible goal. However, the second argument is the one that tends to receive more attention from Marxists and is more frequently cited because it's less problematic. All right. And on that note, like and subscribe, hit the bell, and we'll be back for more discussions of Judge Sabo's talk about Ingalls. Mm -hmm.